tonight is, is, is really, this was kind of how I wanted to open what I was talking about Sunday, about uh, the spirit of love. And so it's interesting. I didn't get to preach last Wednesday night, so I'm going to preach tonight. And so it's, I'm wrapping it back around. Uh, maybe you've heard this story, uh, but if you have, just laugh at the end like everybody else, okay? Um, there's a couple that shared the same birthday, uh, and they were 63 years old. And they were, went on their second honeymoon on an anniversary trip, and they were walking on the beach, and they tripped over something uh, underneath the waves. And the, the husband pulls it out of the waves, and all of a sudden the genie pops out of this lamp that they had found, right? And so this genie comes out of the lamp, and he's like, since it's your 40th anniversary, and you're both 63 years old, I'm going to give you each one wish. The wife immediately says, I want a ring larger than Elizabeth Taylor's diamond. Poof, all of a sudden this massive rock shows up on this ring on her finger. And the husband, thinking he was a little more clever than his wife, says, I wish for a wife that was 33 years, 30 years younger than myself. And poof, he turned 93, and that was it. <laughs> his wife was 63. He was 93 after that. You know, love is a challenge, isn't it? If we're married, then love is a challenge to live better in our marriages. If we're single, it's a challenge to live life of love better between all of our relationships. It's very simply stated that I believe that if we love well, that we'll see, people will see and we will see God better. If God is love and we learn to love like God loves then people will see God better and we will see God better. Ecclesiastes, would you open up your Bibles? Chapter 4, verse 9 through 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 through 12. You know the scripture well. You've heard it many times, usually uh, at a wedding service. um, But it has multiple applications. Verse 9, it says this. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity to the one who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. There's a deep irony uh, in that. A lot of the people that I've come across in life, in ministry, especially in ministry as a pastor, they're married couples, but they can be sometimes the most lonely people I've ever met, even though they're married. Uh, This is seconded by another pastor that I read, Tim Keller, in uh, New York City, said the same exact thing. It's just because you're in the same house or you share the same bed doesn't mean that loneliness is not a possibility. Humans long not just for the presence of one another, but they long for a deep level of intimacy. I mean, it's not just presence necessarily, but there's a level of intimacy that we desire too. So God, I believe, created and subsequently created after marriage the family to keep humans from loneliness. Uh, You know, marriage and family is not a question of which came first, chicken or the egg. We know marriage came first from the Bible, right? Marriage and then family uh, came from there. And so marriage came first. We know that. But there's often times that even in a relationship that there are times, maybe everybody feels this way, that you may feel closer to the electric blanket than you do your spouse, okay? And scripture says that if two lie down together and keep warm, uh, not to lie down with an electric blanket and keep warm, right? The, the connotation of scripture, I believe, is proximity to one another. Because you don't keep warm if you have a king-sized bed and one of you over here and one of you is over here. That's not how it works. You do, however, keep very warm if you have a two-year-old with a fever right next to you in the middle. No, I would say that. Um, So God says, I'm going to give them marriage. I will give people marriage as an institution of intimate communion so that we will be with each other, but most importantly, with God together, intertwined, intermixed. Isolation is contrasted to this communion in that isolation separates us from God and each other. You see, that's the issue he's dealing with here. He says, okay, it's possible to be lonely. It's possible to be isolated in human life. 
So I'm going to give them marriage. He gives them marriage, but then realizes that that's still a possibility in a broken and fallen world that you can still be isolated. And so he gives us, uh, I believe, um, the antidote to that is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. When we lived in Florida, uh, there uh, were lizards. They're brown and knolls everywhere. I mean, they just cover the place. And uh, the kids loved it. We headed down to a science. I may have told you this before, but I would shake one of the hedges or a bush or something like that. All the lizards would run out, and the kids would be standing right there <laughs> ready to grab them. And then they'd grab these little brown anoles, and then they'd usually squeeze them to death or something like that, and they'd die. But uh, it was a lot of fun. But the paradox of it is, of course, is watching my cats. You know, I had one cat at least. And uh, in Florida, go after these lizards. And if you've ever watched a lion stalk its prey or any feline stalk prey, it will do something very intentional. It will isolate that particular prey from the rest of the pack. And once it's finally isolated, alone, it's completely weak at that point in time. And then it knows it can pounce and take the prey without a fight. Because it's alone. However, it's within the herd, if you will, or in the pack that they cannot be defeated. The herd or the gathering together of believers together forms a protective barrier against all things in life, including the enemy, who is like, the scripture says, a roaring lion who prowls about in life trying to devour us. And so if you're entertaining thoughts of isolation, I don't need to be a Christian. I don't need other Christians. I don't need to be a Christian, uh, or I don't need church is one I often hear. I don't need church to be a Christian. Have you ever heard that before? It's a sad misunderstanding of both the Scriptures and really to grasp and experience the riches of communal life in Christ and in the church. It may be paradox, but if you think about it, even God needs God. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not just God alone. It's always the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in forever intimate communion and communication with each other. In much the same way, he kind of begins to project this on the church. He says, I need five people at least to be able to mature the church. The apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the teacher, and the pastor. I need all of them so that the church may become mature. It's the body of Christ. All these illustrations show us that communion or the communal nature of the church, intimacy, not isolation, is the idea. Intimacy in the love of God. And so sometimes, uh, I've said this before, but I, I get this vision of the church going out to war with the enemy or, or to battle. And, and the, the enemy is real. He is a real, uh, a real enemy of our souls, okay? And he goes out to battle, and he, we're already maimed before we ever got to the front lines. Because there are certain believers who have said, I'm not, I'm not going. I'm not going to be in communion with you. I'm not going to stay together. And so we walk out as the body of Christ, and we're missing fingers and toes and, and arms and you know, ears and things like that. And we looked maimed before we ever got there. The paradox, of course, is that we can be even in communion at the church, but never really go deep enough with each other so that our hearts are bared before one another and people see what needs to change. You can come to church and always operate on a surface level and put on your happy face and, and your holy face or whatever you want to call it, your, your mask. or how, there's, a, there's a thousand ways to say it. But never really go deep in what the scriptures calls the koinonia. The, the fellowship, the, the fullness of God's spirit in communion with one another. And that's what we need. We need a community like that. That's what God's love generates. I believe that if we get a good revelation of God's love, that it will naturally express itself in the koinonia, in the community of Christ. Same thing, like I said, can happen in marriage. It takes you about five minutes of being married to discover that all intimacy is directly related to relational quality. All intimacy is related to relational quality. Solomon figured this out. 
He says, two lie down together and they'll keep warm. Listen, I don't care who you lay down with next to you. If they are relationally cold, you'll never be warm. That's just the reality of it. Okay. Um, What Solomon never really figured out, and he multiplied lives and wives and he multiplied concubines, right? Two things that God told him not to do, he does it anyway. He multiplies wives, he multiplies concubines. And what I think that Solomon never really discovered was is how to work out love. Because as soon as one relationship with one wife or concubine would become relationally cold, he'd just go find another one. And he never really discovered what the intimacy of love really looked like, I don't believe. And so God offers us this particular type of communion with each other that takes hard work. Love is not easy. And it requires cultivation and regular maintenance. Okay? This is like the hard facts of love, right? Uh, and if you ever wonder if I'm, I'm talking about marriage right now or I'm talking about your prayer and spiritual life, the answer is yes. You don't have to apply this just to your married life. You need to toggle back and forth right now, thinking of it as your intimate spiritual life. If you want intimacy with God, it's going to require relational intimacy with him. Communion with him. Communication with him. If you want the deeper level of what God is offering you in the love that he has for you, then you have to go deeper into the relationship. It's always synergistic. Always, always, always. God moves, we move. God moves, we move. And it takes that hard work. Um, Let me say it this way. We lived in Florida for almost nine years. They don't even have heat down there, basically. They have electric strips on your air conditioner that it blows air across. That's heat in Florida. It used maybe like two times a year or something like that, at least in the Tampa area where we were. And uh, it, it was not a common thing for us. And I grew up in northern Kentucky. Becca lived in north Dallas. It doesn't get that cold there. Um, but we moved to Florida for nine years or almost nine years. And so... I'll be, I'll be honest with you, man. When I was in Florida in February for school, I, you know, I would, I, I kind of, mi- I missed it a little bit. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it wasn't that warm, but it was warmer than it was here. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so we moved to Kentucky, and then uh, my wife is perpetually cold in the wintertime. She's always cold. Anybody else have somebody in the house that's like, I'm cold all the time. And so I, I, it's like a sport to me to, to try to make her warm enough, you know what I mean? Or it's a sport also to see how cold I can make the house too, but that's a different, that's a different, that's a different sport. <laughs> doesn't bother me at all. Uh, and so the realization is, is that I build fires, and I, it's like the sport to me. I wanted to see how hot I could make the house. And so... Um, uh, thankfully, I didn't burn it down or anything like that, even though I, I did smell some weird smells. But uh, um, I got it up to 80 degrees in the living room. That's pretty warm. You know, 80 degrees, only a fire. That's all we had going. It was 80 degrees in the living room. But it took a lot of wood. And it didn't just start like that. It's not like I just stuck a match and that's how I got the fire. And the fire was instantly 80 degrees. It took me a couple hours to get to the temperature that high. Okay. But also, if you really want to take it back a little bit further, you have to take it back all the way to where I got the wood from. Ryan very graciously lets me come out to his farm and take wood off of it. And he, I think it's a great idea. He thinks I'm stupid because... I'm cleaning up his farm for him, right? (laughs) And so he's got a bunch of fallen trees down there. So what happens is is this. I take my truck. Me and the boys get in the truck with chainsaws and gasoline and oil and all that stuff. And we go out and we pick up the log splitter at the barn. Then we go out into the field and we get out in the field. And then I start sawing logs off of there. And I saw the logs off, and then I make the boys help me. We start up the, the log splitter, and I put the logs on, and then the, uh, the boys run the hydraulics on the log splitter, and I split them and move them, and we just keep going and going and going until that truck bed is full. And then we go all the way back to the house, and then we unload it in the woodshed, and then one by one, we use sleds at my house because I 
one time I bought a whole bunch of sleds after winter time. We didn't have a very good winter, so they were really cheap. So I use a sled and I pull wood all the way up to the house, and then I stack it in the house, and then I have to clean out the ashes, and then you have to bring in the kindling. We go out and get the kindling. You got to bring that in too, and then you finally start the fire. All of that is work. If you expect any heat in your relationship with God or with anybody else, you had better know that it's going to take a long backstory of work to get to that relational heat. I mean, that's just the truth of what love is. And so to understand this in our relational life and the warmth of the intimacy that we have with God is to realize that we come to this place where we just dry and empty come before God and we say, Lord, just light me on fire. I'm ready. I'm empty. I'm dry. I'm ready for you to heat my life up with your love. And so we realize that everything in life waxes and wands, you know, like the moon or the ebbing tides or things like that. Everything waxes and wands, even our relationship with God at times, our relationship with our spouses our, and friends and family. They all wax and they wand. My brother called me yesterday and he said, I haven't heard from you in a while. What have you been doing? I said, I've been busy. I haven't had time to call. And so he was worried about me. You know, our, our relationship, sometimes I call my brother every day. Other times, like, it'll be like a month and a half and I call him. All relationships have this waxing and wanting, and only Jesus we see in Scripture had the perfect relationship with the Father. And he also told us that we would have a much more dynamic relationship, however, with the Father because of the Holy Spirit. You see, I believe that the tongues of fire that came at Pentecost and rested above each person, that those were typification of the fact that, that when we have a spirit-filled life, there's a relational warmth everywhere we go. Hallelujah. It's fire for a reason. Yes, so John Wesley, when he says that he was baptized at Aldersgate, he says, my heart was strangely warmed, was the nomenclature that he used. And so I really don't think that it was heartburn from the chili his wife made him the night before. I believe that it was the power of the Holy Spirit that entered into his heart and filled him. So it's these two guys. One's a psychologist, one's a pastor. And uh, say that marriage was designed by God to counteract loneliness. And so if that's true, then human marriage, it must also be true of the church and Christ in the marriage that we have. There's so many, so many implications here when we begin to look at it in that context, all right? What does a lonely bride of Christ look like? What does a lonely church look like? One that doesn't see people saved or baptized? One that doesn't have God's presence? One that is devoid of love and prayer? One that never changes for the other? Never goes out of its way to please or to invite anyone in. Isn't that interesting? The dynamics of a powerful marriage relationship in the church as the church marriage between Christ and his first love, us, right, are the same in basic proportions to the marriage relationship that we have with our spouses. See, the epitome of a lonely church, I think, is one that has lost its sense of nearness to God's presence. I mean, it's just lost, totally lost its proximity. I mean, they're not even on the other side of the bed. They're, they're out in another room type of thing. I mean, we're talking like Louis and Desi Arnaz, you know what I'm saying? Like two different beds, you know, <laughs> like not even in the same proximity to one another. I wish that just for a moment, and this is what I've been praying all week for our church, is is that God would reveal the true sense of his love to all of our five senses so that we could really grasp the fullness of what his love for us means. You can come, Ryan. I mean, this this is what I'm trying to say. This has been my prayer. It's just that somehow, we realize that God is, to a certain level, distant from us. But then we really examine the scriptures, and you have to question that. Is he really far from us? 
No, he's not. He's in his word, and his word is in our mouth and in our spirit. So he's not. He's in his spirit. He is the spirit himself. So he's in us, and he's enfleshed in us, right? So he's here. N.T. Wright, I love the statement he makes. He says there's a paper-thin membrane between heaven and earth. He's here. His presence is here. I think the biggest problem we have with God is this understanding that though he's present, it's hard for us to see him or to hear him. I just started reading a book today about hearing the voice of God. And he begins the book by this. Uh, it's a syndrome that happens to opera singers. And it's because when they sing, they sing at nearly within a one meter of distance between that opera singer and one meter is 140 decibels. So you sing an opera, and the problem is, is that the sound waves inside your head are louder than 140 decibels. And so it created a hearing loss problem for these opera singers They're basically deaf by different sound ranges, and they're unable to sing in those ranges because they can't hear themselves. There's a certain name for it. It's a syndrome. And so I think what happens in life is we become spiritually deaf in this old factory. We call it fatigue. Old factory fatigue. You can't smell, right? When you start to smell something for so much time, you lose the sense of that smell, and you can't smell it anymore. You go on vacation for a week and you come back to your house and your house smells funny. You're like, why does my house smell like this? It always smelled like this. You're just there every day. Your nose gets used to it. And so I think what we need is we just need like this spiritual kind of jolt, right? To shake us and wake us up and help us to realize that God's presence is here. That he is tangible to all five of our senses if we just wait for him. If we just avail ourselves to him and listen for him. I think this is what Paul realized. I mean, he's talking about the God of the universe who created everything loves me. That's what he's saying. So in Ephesians three fourteen through 21, he says this. For this reason, I kneel before the Father. He can't take it. He's writing, but he's going to sing. He's going to break out in song because he just can't say it in words good enough. From whom every family in heaven and earth derives its name. I I pray that out of the glorious riches that he may strengthen you with his power through the spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with the Lord's holy people. Now listen, this is what his prayer is. To grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of God. The love of Christ. And to know his love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able. This is where he just can't stop. I got to sing. I got to sing. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine according to the power that is work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. That was more than likely a song of the early church. So if you have trouble describing the love of God or the love that you have in Jesus, it's because love surpasses knowledge. And if it surpasses knowledge, you can't describe it. It is literally the indescribable love of God. And I think that if we were really to fully grasp the fullness of God's love that he has for us, I just wonder if you would even be here. I wonder if you'd just disappear like Enoch and Elisha or something like that. I wondered if you'd be so close communion with God that you just cease to exist on this planet. And so then I begin to think about this, that love in creation itself, the communal nature of creation. God said, let us make man in our image. The father loves the son. This is the, the 
predetermined understanding of the Trinity. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. The Spirit loves and serves both the Son and the Father. The Father and the Son love the Spirit. And they're forever in this intimate communion with one another. And then they say, my love is so transcendent, so powerful, that I'm actually going to create. And I wonder if this is why love is most often best expressed through creativity. In the Father and the Son, the Spirit create, and we become the expression of the love of all the universe. We are the pinnacle creation of God. The best, the most intimate creation God has ever had. Never did God say, with the animals, I'm going to have this intimate communion with. No, it was people. We are the pinnacle of God's creation to us. And so I think we can ask this question ultimately. It boils down to this. I want you to just meditate on this for a second. What does the way that I love my spouse or other people tell me about my understanding of the way that God loves me? What does the way that I love my spouse or other people tell me about the way that I understand the way that God loves me? I think that's, that's it. That's the ultimate question that the Holy Spirit's pressing on us tonight. First of all, that we understand what God's love is. And then, really, to be the best indicator of our hearts and God's love in our hearts is to see how we love other people. Because that's really how we think of God's love. In the end, as you meditate on that, The bigger you believe God is, the bigger your perception of his love for you will be also. Just to put it in very simplistic terms, small God, small love. Great big God, great big love. Or what Paul said, I pray that you grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. Do you see it? It's really big. It's really deep. It's really intimate. That's what God's love is. So the depth of our understanding of God will be directly proportional to the depth of your perception of God's love. The greater that you know God, the greater that you understand who He is, the more that you understand His love. And I think this is absolute reality for us. Um, I don't know about you, but I, it was a few Wednesday nights ago I talked about the jealous nature of the love of God. That was probably, in my opinion, the one, that was like, to me, it was, a, it was a sermon that I got done with, and I'm like, man, that's good stuff. You know? <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, yeah, everybody has a, their own hubris, okay? <laughs> that's mine. I was, I was like, that's good stuff. It was just, it was just good because it spoke to me. It spoke to my heart. And you know, one of the most comforting thoughts of God's love is his jealous nature. Because I know that no matter where I go or what I do in life, that God is so jealous of his love for me that he'll do whatever it takes so that I stay in the right smack dab in the middle of his love. That is a comforting thought, isn't it? That if I were to stray away, God is so jealous of my relationship with him. That he's going to do whatever it takes to get me right back to where I should be. Isn't that comforting? That's the jealous nature of God. Let me tell you this one last story before we just spend about five minutes and we're going to meditate on the love of God. And I'm praying that the Lord would just reveal that to you in whatever fashion. Whether it's his tangible love. Whether it's his, uh, the, uh, your sense of smell, your sense of sight, a vision, uh, 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 just feeling the comfort and the closeness of God. Maybe the warmth of God. However it may be, to one of your five senses, or even your knowledge, or your inner man, or however it may be, that he would reveal his love to you tonight. What does love look like? This is old missionary story of this little girl named Kiyote. I love this story. 
Kiyoti's name in some African dialect actually means nobody loves me. She was named that from a child. Nobody loves me. She was an orphan, as you can imagine, sent out into the community until some white missionaries found her and adopted her and took her into her home. And the mom and the dad, they loved her. They lavished on her. They, they cleaned her up. They fed her well. She was starving when she got there, distended stomach, and, you know, all the things that you see in those postcards of, of African children that are starving to death, living on trash heaps. But these missionaries took her in, legally adopted her, and they fed her. They taught her the love of Jesus. And for some reason, eight, nine, ten years old, she just kept going circular. My name is Kiyoti. Nobody loves me. She carried that name like a backpack around with hundreds of pounds of weight in it. Couldn't get past it. My name is Kiyoti, she would say. Nobody loves me. And of course, as you can imagine, her parents, the missionaries, are frustrated. We've tried to do everything to show this girl the love of God. We've tried to do everything to communicate to her that she is loved and that we love her and that she is ours and will always be here for her. And finally, one day she's standing there and she looks down. And she sees her pretty printed dress. And she realizes it's clean and it doesn't have holes in it. And her skin doesn't have sores like it used to. And then she looks down at her full belly and realizes that she doesn't have those hunger pangs like she used to sitting on the trash heap. And it was like as if God was putting up a mirror inside of her heart and saying, Kyoti. It's not your name anymore. Your name's been changed to loved. You see, I think part of the problem of human life is we can focus so small on such a micro level. And what God is saying, let's zoom out, guys. Let's go to the macro. The big overall view. Let's take take you up to 50,000 feet and let me show you my love. The air that you breathe, the warm homes that you live in, the family that you have, your children. And you see the love of God everywhere if you want to see it. I think that's the issue. Have we become deaf to the love of God? So tonight... Let me pray for you, and then we're going to spend about five minutes in meditation, and then we'll sing. But Lord, I pray that tonight as we spend this about five minutes in meditation time and prayer and just intimate communion with you, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to us. That you would shed your love abroad in our hearts. And Lord, that you would take all these five senses that you've given us, and then maybe the sixth sense, which we would call like a spiritual nature of communication that only you can do. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through all this sensory nature. Some of us, Lord, that are visual people, I pray that you would just show us visually, Lord, what you look like and what your love for us looks like. Some of us that are auditory, give us a word. Just speak a word right, right into our ears, into our hearts, into our spirit, man. Some of us, Lord Jesus, that are physical touch people, Lord God, I pray that you would just wrap your arms around us so that we can feel the love of Jesus. Lord, communicate to us tonight, I pray. Speak about your love so that it's real. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, doubt, Lord, that we know it's real. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.